Okay, we're going to do our introductory talk. We've given this at the beginning of Superstars for, for many years, and it's, it's my story of how I went from being a small town, nerdy little fanboy to becoming a number one international best-selling author. And I guarantee you that the path was not a straight line. Uh, we call this the popcorn theory of success, which you will see in a few minutes why. I have always wanted to be a writer. And by that I mean I have always wanted to be a writer. From the time I was five years old, growing up in this little small town in Wisconsin, five years old, my parents let me watch a movie called The War of the Worlds. We got the poster of The War of the Worlds up there. Because I want you to know that I'm talking about the classic 1950-ish uh, War of the Worlds, not that Tom Cruise remake that doesn't really exist as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they let me watch The War of the Worlds. And why my parents would let an imaginative five-year-old watch this movie about a Martian invasion, I'll never know, but it changed my life. In that movie, watching the Martian invasion and the spaceships coming in with their heat rays and wiping out the cities and nothing would stop them. The, the army couldn't stop them and the Air Force couldn't stop them and the atomic bomb couldn't stop them and, and, and Godzilla couldn't, no, that was a different movie. Um, <laughs> Nothing could stop the Martians, and they're leveling our cities, and the humans are about to be wiped out, and everybody's huddling in like churches and in bomb shelters, just waiting for the end. And then all the Martian ships just slowly wobble in the air and drift to the ground and crash. And then this hatch opens up in the bottom of one of the Martian ships, and this three-fingered, suckered alien hand comes crawling out, and it's all covered with black blotches, and it curls up, and the Martians just die. And it turns out that the Martians are so advanced that they don't have any immunity to the common cold. Our Earth diseases have wiped them out, and they all die. Sorry for the spoiler, but it was written in 1897. Anyway, that blew my mind. I was five years old. I lay awake all that night just like seeing these visions of Martians and aliens in my head, and I wanted to tell stories like that. I made up my mind that I was going to be a writer. I was going to tell science fiction stories. I was going to make other people feel the way that I felt. I had a handicap, though, at the time because I was five, and I didn't know how to write. So what I did was I took the... the scratch pad next to the, the telephone, and I drew pictures, little scenes from the movie that I remembered seeing, and I would lay these pictures out on the floor, and anybody who walked by, I would stop them and tell them the story of the War of the Worlds, because I wanted other people to experience this drama and inspiration that I did. That was kind of cool, and I wanted to be a writer, and so, I did eventually learn how to read and write, which was kind of a key first step in becoming a writer. Now, I grew up in this very small town, and I wanted to read books, read other science fiction books, and by the time I was eight, eight and a half years old, something like that, um, I knew how to read. I was kind of voraciously trying to pick up other books, and again, this was a very, very small town. It was so small that we didn't have a library what we had was the bookmobile. And the bookmobile, as you can see from the picture there, the bookmobile is like a Winnebago filled with books. And it would drive from little town to little town in Wisconsin every weekend, and it would, uh, like once a month, it would come to our town and park in the bank parking lot. And you, I had my little child's library card, and I would borrow a bicycle and I would ride the country roads for like two miles to get to the bookmobile and every every like third Saturday or whatever it was I'd go there and and they had like a couple of shelves in their children's section of all different kinds of books and I just started checking them out and reading every book that they had in the children's section and I just plowed through them I didn't care what they were about I wanted to read all these books because at the time I was young and ambitious and I made up my mind that I was gonna read every book in the world because it was all there in the bookmobile, obviously. So I read through every book in the children's section of the bookmobile. And after I finished the children's section, my mind just naturally wandered to the adult bookstore. I 
the, the, the adult <laughs> section in the bookmobile. And the adult section in the bookmobile was this, this row of shelves of books, and they had a science fiction section. All these cool books, and they all had a sticker down at the bottom of the spine that had, that had a rocket ship with an atom symbol around it. So you just knew they had to be good. And they all had these little labels on the bottom. And I made up my mind I was going to read all those books because of the War of the Worlds, and I wanted to read all these science fiction books. And the first book on the shelf was a good old classic called The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke. And for any of you who have read it, The Sands of Mars is like this perfectly innocuous 1950s-ish um, science fiction adventure of a boy on Mars and he meets an alien and there's a colony and, and it, I picked it up and I wanted to read this book. It was the first one on the shelf and of course I was going to go and read all of them. So I took this book and I'm going to read it and I went up to the front desk and uh, the bookmobile librarian with my little child's library card and I'm going to check out this book. I, I, wanted, I wanted to be a writer. You know I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't have any medical background. I wasn't going to take any sort of anatomy classes or, or um, become a surgeon or anything medical at all. But even then, at about eight and a half years old, when I brought my book up to this pinch-faced old prune librarian sitting there in the, in the uh, bookmobile, I diagnosed that she suffered from persistent hemorrhoids. <laughs> because when I tried to check out The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke, she just looked at the book, and she looked at me, she looked at the book, and her face scrunched up, and she said, you can't check out this book, it's for grown-ups only. <laughs> I, may, I may be exaggerating a little, but that's how I remembered it anyway. So I couldn't check out the book, and I rode my bike back home, and I was kind of dejected because this was this was a big deal for me. And my mom noticed that something was wrong. And she wondered what was going on. And I, I said, well, I, I went to the bookmobile and the librarian suffers from chronic hemorrhoids and wouldn't let me check out the book. And so my mom took me by the arm and she marched me outside and put me in the front seat of the car and drove down to the bookmobile and we stormed up the steps of the bookmobile and she went right to the front desk of Hemorrhoid Lady and she said, you let him check out any book he wants to, he's reading. And so I got my book. <laughs> but obviously this pointed out the fact that, that we needed to have books in our house. And my parents found an ad in the Sunday newspaper supplement, the Parade Magazine supplement, for 100 classics of literature for $25. It was the Airmont Classics Library. It was a bunch of cheap paperback books. And I remember the day that the UPS guy showed up and delivered these boxes of books. And we spent the afternoon in the living room opening up the boxes of books. And there was Journey to the Center of the Earth and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and The Time Machine, and Frankenstein, and Dracula, and The War of the Worlds was in there by H.G. Wells, and Kidnapped, and The Black Arrow, and, and crap like Jane Austen, but who cares about stuff like that? <laughs> so I suddenly had all these books, and I'm reading all these books, and they're like opening up my mind, and I'm, I'm realizing that, that wow, if, I gotta, if I'm gonna be a writer, I've got a pretty high bar to meet. But I felt I was adequately prepared to write my first novel then because I had all these books and I had you know, gone through the entire section in the bookmobile and I was almost nine years old so I was ready to write my first novel. Uh, and so I went into my dad's study and I sat down in front of my dad's manual typewriter. I, I see we have some younger people in the audience. A typewriter is like a steampunk version of a laptop. <laughs> and you type, anyway. So my dad had this pile of bright pink scratch paper for some reason. And I, I took the first page of this bright pink scratch paper and I rolled it into the, uh, into the typewriter. I rolled it in and I started typing and I wrote my first novel over the course of a week. It was about three pages long. It was called The Injection. 
And in the injection, it was about a mad scientist who invents this serum that will bring anything to life. And the other scientists don't believe him, so the mad scientist decides to get his revenge. Because even at nine years old, I understood that mad scientists were supposed to get their revenge. It was character motivation and all that. So he takes his serum and he goes to the wax museum and he injects all the wax museum figures and he brings to life the, uh, the werewolf and the Phantom of the Opera and the Frankenstein monster and the, the mummy and they all start shambling out. And then he goes to the Natural History Museum and he brings all the dinosaur skeletons to life. And so you got this army of wax museum, uh, museum monsters and you've got dinosaur skeletons and he's riding on this triceratops skeleton in the front of his army and they're going to rampage the city because, you know, mad scientists go on the rampage. And he's riding this triceratops skeleton kind of between the shield and, and he's, he's like marching and leading them forward. But, I also understood enough about literature that mad scientists are, and your villains are supposed to have a character flaw. They're supposed to have hubris. And the hubris in my mad scientist was, of course, I'm sure you've already guessed it, that he did not realize that reanimated triceratops skeletons tend to rear up at inopportune times. And so this, this triceratops skeleton rears up right when they're under the electrical wires. It electrocutes my mad scientist and kills him. The end. <laughs> I was almost nine years old. It's still better than some of the new Transformers movies or something. But we're, <laughs> we're kind of hoping that Michael Bay will option that one. Okay, so I thought that was pretty cool. And I wrote that story, and I wanted to be a writer. And I think by the time I was 10 or 10 and a half years old, I had saved up enough money uh, from my allowance, and I would go up and down like the, the highway, and I would pick up aluminum cans, and you recycle them for a nickel apiece. So I saved up all my money, and I had enough that I could either buy my own brand new bike like any normal kid, or I could buy my own personal typewriter. And because I wanted to be a writer, I spent all of my money that I had saved on a Smith Corona electric cartridge typewriter so I could be a writer. Ten and a half years old. That's what I wanted to be. So I kept writing. I kept plunking out stories. Uh, I went to high school. Um, in high school, I think I was a junior in high school, and I took a medieval history class. Medieval history class, you know, all the, because I wanted to write fantasy fiction and stuff, so I wanted to know about castles and kings. And, and we had a teacher, um, and we had to do a term paper. And like all of you know, term papers are boring. I didn't really want to do a term paper. I kind of wanted to do a short story. So I went to my, my teacher for this history class, and I said, if I do all the research and I get all the details right, can I just write a, a short story set in a medieval time period and do all the accurate stuff and, and could that be my term paper? Please, please. Now, in small town Wisconsin, the reason that they hire history teachers is because they're good wrestling coaches. <laughs> and this guy was a really good wrestling coach and had taken us to state like three years in a row he didn't necessarily know anything about history and wasn't all that great of a teacher, but he had to teach a class in order to be the wrestling coach. So he looked at me and said, well, I don't care. So I got to write a short story for my term paper. And I did my research and I decided to do a short story set during the Black Death, the bubonic plague that wiped out this huge chunk of Europe in the 13, mid 13, 1400, something like that. And I'm choosing Black Death because, you know, death. I'm a junior in high school. I'm interested in plagues and bring out your dead and stuff like that. So I wrote this story called Blessed Are the Pure in Heart about twin boys, and they like to read the old family Bible, and they like to read the Beatitudes, the, you know, blessed are the pure in heart and blessed are the cheese makers and whatever else the, the listing is. And they read it to each other. Uh, and then one boy starts to show the symptoms of the plague. And the first symptoms of the bubonic plague are you get swellings under your arms 
and then you get a high fever, and you get sicker and sicker, and then finally you start getting black blotches all over your skin, and then you die. So this twin starts getting swellings under his arms. Um, they lived with their father. The mother had died in childbirth or something like that. So it was just the two boys and the father. The father freaks out, doesn't want plague in his house, so he kicks the sick boy out into the streets. So the good twin brother decides to follow his brother and take him around the city, uh, medieval city, to try to cure him of the plague. And first he takes him to a magician who makes the sick boy walk counterclockwise through a green smoke fire, and he puts an amulet on him with the word abracadabra, which vanishes down to the point, um, all these stuff, which was accurate historical details from my research. And that doesn't work. So then he takes him to a medieval doctor who wants to get the evil humors out of his body, so he puts leeches on the kid, and he bleeds him from his arms, and... and Surprise, that doesn't work either. So finally, as the boy's getting worse and worse, and he's got like black blotches on his skin, his twin takes him into the cathedral so that he can uh, have the priest give him the last rites. And the priest gives him the last rites, and they're sitting in the pew, and the, the, the good twin pulls out the family Bible, and he reads the Beatitudes to his dying brother, who then like does a last gasp and dies in his arms. At which point, the other twin closes the family Bible and slides it into his shirt right up against the swellings that have started to form under his arms. So that was my short story. That was my term paper. I got an A. So I went home and I said, Mom, Mom, I wrote my story. I wrote my term paper and I got an A on it. And my mom said, good, let, let me read this story. So I gave her the story to read and I went and did whatever high school kids did in the afternoon. Considering I was a nerd, I probably watched Star Trek reruns or something like that. And I came out like half an hour later to find my mom sitting on the sofa with the manuscript that I had given her, reading it, and she's got tears pouring down her face. And I'm looking at my mom reading this story, and I thought, I wrote something that had that much of an effect on somebody. It brought tears to my mom's eyes. Now, lots of teenagers make their moms cry, but <laughs> not for that reason, and I thought it was pretty cool. So I decided it must be a good story. It got an A. It made my mom cry. I'm going to send it out to a magazine, and I sent it out to Boy's Life and found out and I received my very, very first form rejection slip. I was on my way. Anyway, about uh, a year after that, I had my very first short story published in a Wisconsin high school writings magazine. And it was like a three paragraph long trick ending story, which um, I was very proud of. And it was really cool. Uh, I got it published. And here's a little secret irony that I have not told anybody yet because it just happened. I mentioned earlier that I'm in classes now to take uh, MFA to get my master's degree. I took a flash fiction class in which you have to write really, really short fiction. Well, I had one week I was really busy and we were supposed to turn in an assignment of flash fiction. I sent in the story that I had written when I was 11 years old. They all loved it and I got an A on it. <laughs> No, I didn't, I didn't tell them where it came from. <laughs> okay, so again, I'm telling you I lived in this really, really small town in Wisconsin. It didn't have a library. It had a bookmobile. But also, it did not have a record store. And when you're a junior in high school is when you really start getting into music and listening to rock music, and especially the kind of music that will really annoy your parents. We didn't have a record store, but we did have the Columbia Record Club. The Columbia Record Club was something that came in the mail, and if you signed up for it, you could get like 12 albums for a dollar. Albums were these big platter things, kind of like CDs, only they were analog. For, um, 
Okay, CDs were what we had before MP3s. This gets harder and harder every, every year. Anyway, what you did was you put little stamps. They had all these little stamps that had album covers on them. And you'd peel off the stamps of the albums that you wanted and put it down on the sign-up sheet. And I'm like wanting to get into this stuff. And there were albums that I wanted and I already knew, but I didn't have 12 of them that I wanted. However, looking at all these sheets of stamps, there were albums on there that, that looked like science fiction albums. There was the Alan Parsons Project, I, Robot, and the Alan Parsons Project, Edgar Allan Poe, Tales of Mystery and Imagination. And there was Styx, The Grand Illusion, and Kansas, Left Overture, and Kansas, Point of No Return, with this sailing ship sailing off the edge of the earth with sea monsters all around it. And there was stuff by this rock group called Rush that I had never heard of before. They're from Canada, and they had this one thing called 2112 that kind of looked like science fiction, and it was 2112, and there's a red star on it. And there's something else called Rush, a farewell to kings, with this ruined castle and a king there with puppet strings on his, on his arms. And then there's another one called Hemispheres, with, this, as you can see, a giant brain and, and a naked guy on the cover, so my mom didn't want me to see that. But, um, so I'm just putting these things down. I thought they sounded cool. I didn't know anything about it. And I got the records, and I'm playing them, and oh boy, this is music to annoy your parents by. It is great. It's got uh, you know, heavy, heavy metal guitars and loud drums and... and it's the, the vocalist Getty Lee has this high-pitched, shrieking voice that Rolling Stone magazine compared to a man suffering from testicular torsion. <laughs> it was great. And some of these things are stories. Like 2112 is a dystopian science fiction story about a, a future, a repressive future that's run by the priests of the temples of Syrinx, and they have outlawed all creativity and all music and all artwork and all writing, and everything is sort of grim and repressive, and this guy finds a guitar in an old ruined building, and he doesn't know what it is, but he cleans it up and figures out that if he plucks the strings, he can make music. So he teaches himself how to play, and he goes to the priest and says, look what I found, and he plays, uh, plays the music, and he says, this is... this." This is wonderful stuff. And the priests say, no, it's forbidden. And they smash the guitar and send him away. And he's so depressed, he goes back to his house and slashes his wrists and dies. It's just not, ooh, baby, baby, my girlfriend left me music. <laughs> Farewell to Kings has this great thing about uh, Cygnus X-1, about a rich guy who takes his own spaceship to explore the black hole of Cygnus X-1. And he goes too close to the gravity well, and he gets sucked in, and, and the last sound on the album is this pounding guitars and drums and Geddy Lee's wailing voice as the guy gets sucked down into the black hole. And then Rush came out with a sequel album, which is Hemispheres, where the guy comes out the other end of the black hole into the universe where the Greek gods have gone to hide, and they're at war with each other, and he brokers a peace among the Greek gods. This is cool stuff. This is not um, whining about your girlfriend. But... I was a nerdy kid with a bad haircut and glasses, and I read comic books, and I had hand-me-down clothes, and I wasn't going to get a girlfriend anyway, so I might as well listen to Rush. <laughs> they were very inspirational to me. And I listened to that music, and I wrote a bunch of stories that were inspired by their songs, and uh, I, I kept going. and. One of those stories, I think, uh, got published when I was a senior in high school. I got paid $12.50 for it. So I went to my parents and said, see, I can make a living as a writer. And my parents made me promise that when I went to college that I would not major in creative writing. I had to do something where I could get a job. So I promised them I would not major in creative writing. I instead majored in astronomy with a minor of Russian history. And I went to college and got my degree, and at about that time, I was going to writer's conferences, and I was like this, of course there's nothing like superstars, but I went to writer's conferences, and I was trying to learn, and at that time, 
I won my very first trophy as a writer. As you can see in the picture, it's a beautiful, if I can untangle it here, it's a beautiful real trophy, marble base and everything. It's got fluted columns, winged victory, the guy's head's knocked off, um, brass plaque, an engraved brass plaque. Um, Kelly, you can't possibly even read what the engraving said, but I won this trophy at a writer's conference. It's my first writing award. The brass plaque names me the writer with no future. Because I could produce more rejection slips by weight than any other writer at the entire conference. So this is my first writing award. I still have it. It rests in the toilet tank top of my bathroom in my office at home. So, I went to college, got my degree, and I wanted to do something with writing, and I sent applications around, so I went, I got a job interview at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory was a big nuclear weapons design lab in the San Francisco area, and I wanted to be a technical writer. And at this time, I had published a handful of short stories, I had published some articles, um, so I had a few publication background. And I took this interview, and, and the people who are interviewing me are going, well, wow, you, you have a background in astronomy and physics, so you understand the science of what we're doing. You have a minor in Russian history, and this was during the Soviet Union Cold War days, and that's what we were worried about with building nuclear weapons. So my Russian history background was really great. And I had these writing publication credits from my, you know, the um, small press magazines and all these little things. You're a perfect candidate for, for being a technical writer for us. They hired me, job offer right there on the spot with benefits and a security clearance and a starting salary that was more than my dad was making as a bank president. And my parents said, we knew you could do it. <laughs> so that was great. So I'm doing my job as a tech writer. I'm still writing. I'm writing novels. Um, I'm, I'm submitting things. I actually got an agent based on the short story sales that I had done. Uh, and I sent my agent. Um, my first fantasy novel, because everybody writes a first fantasy novel. It had a magic sword and dragons and, and the quest from one end of the map to the other with insert adventure here all the way through. You've read that novel. Um, so I wrote that one. I said to my agent, should I write the second novel in the trilogy while you try to sell this one? And my agent said, uh, no, because if I can't sell book one, you're wasting your time. Write something completely different. And I had in mind an idea for sort of a, a gothic horror science fiction murder mystery that was interesting and unlike anything else that I had ever read. Sort of a, um, instead of building robots to do all the dirty work, they just take human bodies, dead bodies that are perfectly intact, they jumpstart them to become like robot zombies and they do ditch digging and handling toxic wastes and all the grunt work. And I'm thinking of my story, and I'm, I, my character is basically a guy who's been murdered on page one, and he's brought back as a servant. Um, generally, uh, unwittingly, he is working for the guy who killed him, and he starts getting flashbacks of his first life. Now, while I was plotting this book and thinking of it, Rush came out with a new album called Grace Under Pressure. And this album has all kinds of science fiction based stories on them about there's no swimming in the heavy water, there's no singing in the acid rain, there's one called The Enemy Within, uh, there's one called uh, Are We the Only Humans Left Alive, uh, there's one called The Body Electric about uh, an android on the run trying to escape. And every one of these songs seems to be tying right into my novel. And I thought that's kind of neat, so what I wanted to do is make everything in my novel fit with the album. So I wrote my chapters so that all of the stuff in my story tied to the lyrics in the album. Secretly, of course, because I didn't want to pay for the rights or anything. So I wrote my novel, and I turned it in, and my agent sent it out. 
So I'm still at work and I'm a full-time technical writer and I've got my office and I'm doing like respirator safety manuals and, and how to handle plutonium books and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And I came back to my office one day after about a, a year or so that my agent had these novel manuscripts. And I came back to find a blinking light in my answering machine. An answering machine is kind of like voicemail, only with a real cassette tape in it. And so I rewound the cassette tape and played my agent's message that said, Hi, Kevin, this is your agent, and I've got great news. I just sold your first novel, Resurrection Inc., to Signet Books, and it'll be a mass market original. They're a science fiction line. It'll be out next summer, and my brain just sort of exploded. So I did what any normal person would do. I ran screaming up and down the hall going, I sold my first novel, I sold my first novel. And I would go from office to office to office and I'm explaining to everybody that, that I sold my first novel, Resurrection Inc. and it's, it's gonna be published by Signet Books as a mass market original and their science fiction line. And, and I'm like gushing and I'm telling anybody that will listen and I'm stopped and I, I even talked to the janitor who didn't speak English but I was so excited I just went and I'm, I'm going around the office building and I finally get around to this place um, I'm halfway around and I'm realizing, you know, I just sold my first novel. I have it on tape, on my answering machine, my agent telling me that I sold my first novel. But it's only going to be my first novel because I'm going to sell a lot of novels. I'm going to get a multiple book contract. I'm going to be on the bestseller list someday. I'm going to be famous someday. I'm going to win awards for my books. I'm going to keep writing books. And, and I've got on tape the first acceptance of my first novel. And who knows, the Smithsonian might want that tape someday. So I went back to my office so that I could keep it, only to find that while I was going around the office building like an idiot babbling, that somebody had called in and recorded over the announcement to tell me I had a photo order to pick up. Oh well, that wasn't gonna dampen my day. And so I'm like walking on air. My agent then sold my fantasy trilogy, so that one came out. And I'm, I'm working on, on like writing and editing this stuff. And I got my cover for Resurrection Inc. from the Signet Books. And I have to warn you, some, some content may not be suitable for viewers with good taste. Um, <laughs> this is the ugliest cover that has ever shown up in publishing history. I loved it. I mean, look at this. It's a stone skull with, with a spaceship flying above it, and there's people in hot pink and bright green pantsuits for some reason. Um, but it's Resurrection Inc., and it's wonderful. And I got, um, I got all of my uh, editing done, and I put in the acknowledgments that this book was inspired by the lyrics, the haunting story in the Rush album, Grace Under Pressure. And I thanked Getty Lee, the vocalist, Alex Lifeson, the guitarist, and Neil Peart, the drummer, who wrote all the lyrics for all the songs. And when the book finally came out, I autographed a copy, one to each of the guys, and I mailed it to Mercury Records, where I'm sure it promptly went on to the same warehouse that is storing the Ark of the Covenant. So I didn't hear anything for a year, got nothing happening. I published my second book, my third book. I'm still writing, I'm building my career. And I had what we'd qualify as a really crappy day. I had my, one of my annual reports at work came out with a truly embarrassing typo on the very front cover where I misspelled the author's name. Not terribly good. And then some other scientist presentation who was ready to take these, these PowerPoint view graph things and gonna run off to a lasers conference and for some reason all of the photos had been printed upside down. That's not good. Something else happened that I, I can't even remember. But worst of all, one of my books got reviewed in Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. One of the biggest science fiction magazines in the world. I had never had a book reviewed by one of my, my Peers, my major magazines, and this reviewer just loathed my book, hated it, tore me new orifices, insulted my family, hated my book. 
you know, a typical Amazon review. Um, <laughs> so that was not a good day. And I came home, and I was rather dejected, and I found... I got the mail, and there was Safeway flyers and electric bills and junk mail, and a letter with a Canadian stamp on it. And the return address said, Neil Peart. I opened it up, and Neil Peart, the drummer from Rush, one of my, one of my idols, the guy who had written the entire lyrics for the album, Grace Under Pressure, that inspired my novel, Grace Un or my novel Resurrection, Inc., had read my book and wrote me a seven-page single-space fan letter about how much he loved it. And it was no longer a crappy day. <laughs> so I have known Neil for very close to 30 years now, and we've been good friends. Anyway, so I went on, kept writing, and I got a phone call one day from my editor at Bantam Books, out of the blue, and she said, Kevin, do you like Star Wars? And I said, well, of course I like Star Wars. Everybody likes Star Wars. This was before episode one. Um, <laughs> everybody likes Star Wars. What do you want? And she said, would you like to write three sequels to it? And I thought long and hard, and I said, yes, I can do that. And so she signed me up to write a trilogy, the Jedi Academy trilogy. So I signed up for that, and I immediately decided to go into doing my heavy research in Star Wars, which meant watching the movies over and over again, playing with my Boba Fett action figures so I could choreograph all the battles right, plotting my story. And then one of my friends who happened to work for Dark Horse Comics found out that I was writing the Star Wars trilogy. And she contacted me and said, well, Kevin, we're collecting all of our Dark Empire Star Wars comic series, and we would like you to write the introduction for it. So I said, there are Star Wars comics? You better send me a bunch of them. So she sent me a box of Star Wars comics, and I read them all, and I wrote the introduction for this. And in the course of that, I got to meet Tom Veach, the guy who writes all those Star Wars comics. And he was doing a new series called Tales of the Jedi, which... Um, is set 4,000 years before the movies with the old Jedi Knights. Well, in my Jedi Academy trilogy, it just so happened that one of my villains is the spirit of a long dead Dark Lord of the Sith. And since he was writing stories set 4,000 years before the movies, and since I had a long dead Dark Lord of the Sith, we got to brainstorming and thought, well, why didn't my guy live just like 4,000 years ago? And so we could tie his origin story with the Tales of the Jedi comics, and we wrote those together. He contacted me and we brainstormed and he taught me how to write comic scripts. And so we ended up writing, um, I think it was 26 issues together of this whole the Sith War and the Dark Lords of the Sith and all that background. So I'm writing the Jedi Academy trilogy and I did the introduction. We're doing these comics. And then I got a call from uh, the person at Lucasfilm. And she said, so Kevin, the artist Ralph McQuarrie is thinking of retiring. And for those of you who don't know, Ralph McQuarrie's a very famous artist. He's, he's influential in Star Wars. He's the guy who designed Darth Vader and C-3PO and, and Cloud City and the Jawa Sandcrawler. And Star Wars looks the way it looks because of Ralph McQuarrie. And he was also a very good friend of George Lucas's. And he wanted to retire but do a big, beautiful, brilliant um, career-capping art book, coffee table book, filled with all sorts of new paintings of different places in the Star Wars universe. And they, were, they, Lucasfilm, were looking for a writer to do like fake National Geographic articles set on the Star Wars planets. And this writer, whoever it was going to be, would have to meet with this famous artist, Ralph McQuarrie, at least once a month to go over the writing and sketches and all this stuff. But because Ralph couldn't paint nearly enough paintings and sketches to fill an entire book, this writer, who, whoever it was going to be, would have to spend many, many days up at Skywalker Ranch in the Lucasfilm Art Archives to dig through all the drawers of all the sketches and all the paintings that had never been seen before to pull out anything that was worth publishing to include it into the book. And this writer, whoever it was going to be, in addition to that, 
would have to meet directly with George Lucas several times because Ralph was such a very good friend of George Lucas's that George wanted to make sure that everything was, was on track. And Kevin, would you be interested in doing this project? And I'm like uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop and I thought, well, but there are other Star Wars writers. There's Timothy Zahn and Dave Farland and other writers that were going on. I said, so did all these other writers turn you down? Why are you asking me? And she said, oh no, nothing like that, nothing like that at all. It's just that you're the only writer who's within driving distance of Ralph McQuarrie's house in Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> so that's how I got the job to do the illustrated Star Wars universe. So I'm going up to Skywalker Ranch every month, sitting in the, now this, Lucasfilm Art Archives really is like the warehouse of the Ark of the Covenant. It's huge and millions of drawers and shelves and file cabinets. And I'm spending days there and pulling out, you know, Yoda in his underwear and Chewbacca's outhouse and all kinds of things that should never be seen. Um, and I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm there when the deputy publisher of Bantam Books is talking to the Lucasfilm uh, Art Archives person or the Lucasfilm uh, licensing person, and they're talking about doing an anthology, that they want to do a collection of short stories based in the Star Wars universe, but they kind of didn't want to worry about the continuity, and they were going to get messed up with uh, ten different people writing Luke Skywalker stories, and they basically gave up on the idea because it was too complicated. And I'm over there pulling out, you know, spaceship drawings and, and Chewbacca's bicycle or whatever he's got. Uh, and I'm looking at this and I looked up and I said, oh no, you don't do it that way. You just do a short story collection of all the people in the cantina scene. Like the, the bartender who hates droids and the, uh, the guy who's got the death sentence on 12 systems and the story of the band and uh, um, Greedo when he actually didn't shoot first and things like that. And just do all those stories and they don't connect to anything and they won't interfere with the uh, continuity. And, and so I'm going back and looking at more spaceship drawings and stuff, and I realize it's totally silent. And I looked up and I said, uh, and I can edit that for you if you want, because they're just staring at me. So that's how I got the job to edit Tales of the Moss Eisley Cantina. And I, like a day after I come back home from Lucas Ranch, the person calls me up and said, Kevin, we really like that idea. We love the idea of the Cantina Anthology. And I said, well, thanks. And they said, if, if you can think of another one, we'd love to pitch a second idea to Bantam. And I said, well, how about like Tales from Jabba the Hutt's Palace, the, the story of the green dancing girl and the story of the band there and the story of the, the boy who keeps a monster in the basement and all that stuff. And they said, that's wonderful. Write up a proposal and, and we'll send it to Bantam. And I said, that's great, except I'm writing the Jedi Academy trilogy in 26 issues of Dark Lords of the Sith comics and I'm doing the illustrated Star Wars universe and I'm doing the Mos Eisley Cantina anthology. Um, I'm a little busy right now. It'll take me a bit to, um, to finish up and get a proposal to you. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. Just whenever you can, there's no hurry. Well, she called back the next day and said, never mind, I just mentioned it to Bantam and they bought it. <laughs> but they don't want just one, they want two, so think of a third one. So that's why we also have Tales of the Bounty Hunters and Tales from Java's Palace. And those three books are the three best-selling science fiction anthologies of all time. So I'm glad I was listening. And then I, had, I was up there having lunch with Lucasfilm person. And she said, Kevin, we've been thinking do you suppose there might be any, any young adult interest in Star Wars at all? <laughs> I'm wondering if they had seen their movies, but, but I said, yes, I think there might be. And they said, well, could you write a young adult series for us, the Young, young Jedi Knights? Well, actually, we developed the idea, but they wanted a Young Jedi Knights series. And I said, I can do that, but my wife is the young adult reader or writer, can she write them with me? Because Rebecca and I would work together. And they said, sure, you can do that. So we signed up for three Young Jedi Knights books. 
And they read the first one and said, oh, this is really good. Do six instead, which then turned into 11, which then turned into 14. And all of those books came out three months apart. So for 14 books, every three months, we turned in another book in addition to the other Star Wars books I was doing, in addition to my own books that I was doing. And as those were coming out, I got contacted by a person from Chris Carter, Chris Carter's office, the creator of the X-Files, who said, Kevin, I like your Star Wars books. Would you write X-Files books for me? And I said, yes, I can do that. And I'll just very quickly talk about the reason we mention this is the popcorn theory of success. And I can smell popcorn in the background. That sounds kind of, it smells kind of interesting. I liken it to popcorn because if you listen to everything that I was just talking about, think about making popcorn. There's a couple of ways that you can make popcorn, sort of the old fashioned way. We're not talking about popping it in a microwave. If you're doing it on a stove, there are a couple of ways you can make popcorn. You could take your pan and clean it out and wash it, make sure that it's clean, and you set it on the stove top. And then you measure exactly the right amount of oil, like a tablespoon of oil, and put it in the bottom, and you spread it out so it's perfectly even. And then you go to your jar of popcorn kernels, and you sort through them, and you find exactly the right popcorn kernel, the perfect popcorn kernel. And you take that kernel, and you put it in the center of the pan, because it's got to be even heat and everything symmetrically placed. And you put this popcorn kernel there. And then you turn up the heat, but you turn it up slowly so that the oil heats up slowly, the kernel heats up slowly. You want it everything even, and it gradually grows and gradually grows. And then you wait, and you watch the little bubbles form in the oil, and you look down at the popcorn kernel, and you're waiting and waiting, and finally, the temperature builds to the spot. Finally, you're watching this popcorn kernel, and finally it pops, and it flies up into the air, and you go, fly, little kernel, fly, and you catch the popcorn kernel, and you set it aside on the strategically placed napkin that you put there. And then you take the pan and go back to the sink, and you wash it out and clean it, and you dry it, and then you go back to the stovetop, and measure out the oil again. Go find another popcorn kernel, and you put it in the center of the pan. And if you do that, you're going to starve. <laughs> the other way to make popcorn is to put oil in the pan, add a bunch of popcorn kernels, turn up the heat, and wait. If you wait long enough, and you have enough heat, and you have enough popcorn kernels, something is going to pop. You have no idea where it's going to fly, which kernel's going to pop, what's going to happen, but it's going to pop. With what I just told you about all those Star Wars uh, projects, the X-Files projects, the comics projects, and of course after that I, I started working with Brian Herbert and we did Dune books and we did 15 of the Dune books and those kept going and I wrote I think 50 of my own novels. I could never have predicted what any of those was going to do how any one thing was going to pop, or how one was going to lead to another, or open a door for another thing. But you have to put in a lot of popcorn kernels, try different things, and something is going to work. And that's the popcorn theory of success, and that's what you're smelling in the background. And I do want to just, just wrap up and do a couple of quick, quick summary things. Now, throughout all this, I still stayed very close friends with Neil Peart, the drummer from Rush. We'd written a short story together. He wrote the introduction to one of my uh, short story collections. And he wrote me a letter saying, uh, asking if I thought steampunk was going to stick around. Because I had written a bunch of steampunk. He read my books. He enjoyed them. And I said, why, yes, I think steampunk will stick around. It's a really cool thing. And he was thinking of doing a Rush concept album of a steampunk fantasy adventure with airships and pirates and lost cities. And I thought that was really cool. I'm a geeky Rush fanboy. I'm thrilled that the drummer from Rush is asking me about the lyrics he's writing for this new Rush album, this concept album, that was going to be called Clockwork Angels. And he was so excited about this, he sent us the lyrics, sent me the lyrics as he was writing it. We got the rough cuts of the songs as they were doing it. And Rebecca and I met him for lunch in a diner in Santa Monica. 
Uh, and he was so pumped and so excited about Clockwork Angels. And this is a great story, and this is better than anything they've done. And it's not just going to be an album. It's going to be a Broadway musical. It's going to be a novel. It's going to be Ice Follies. And I'm a Rush fan, so I went, yay, Ice Follies. <laughs> but Rebecca was listening more closely, and she said, um, excuse me, Neil, you, you said a novel. Who's going to write the novel? And he said, well, Kevin is, of course. <laughs> and Ice Follies, and we're talking about Ice Follies, on and on and on. Um, and so he worked with me, and we developed the entire story to go with the Clockwork Angels album. And this is the biggest thing that I can imagine doing. This is as big as Star Wars. This is as big as, as uh, the Dune books or X-Files, because Rush is a huge popular musical group. In fact, according to some statistics, they are the number three best-selling musical uh, group in all of human history. After the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and then Rush. They were about to go on tour for two years to promote the album, to sell out crowds at every arena that they went to. They were going to have the novel Clockwork Angels for sale beside their program book to tens of thousands of people, concert after concert after concert. My book, or our book, and the program book. Do you think I could get any of my publishers to agree to publish it? They said, how do you write a novel based on an album? Do Rush fans even read? <laughs> and so we went with a Canadian publisher instead, ECW Press, who did a fabulous job. Clockwork Angels is the novel uh, in the center there. The album, Clockwork Angels, is the square one up on uh, the upper left. Uh, the paperback version is the blue cover. Uh, we did a graphic novel version of Clockwork Angels. Clockwork Angels, the novel, came out, and within the first couple of days, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. And I was able to write to Neil or text Neil as he was about to go up on stage for a concert in New Hampshire on his 60th birthday that he was not only an adequate drummer but he was also a New York Times best-selling author and so we did Clockwork Angels and then after that um, we did Clockwork Lives which is a sequel to it which I think is even better and when I had Neil read the final manuscript he wrote me and said KJ, this is the best thing that you have ever written, and I think it is. And the other picture there, which no one has before seen, so this is debuting for you guys, that's the cover for our brand new graphic novel of Clockwork Lives that comes out in June. And so, because the Clockwork Angels and Clockwork Lives, oh, and, and all of those contained illustrations especially Clockwork Angels, a bunch of paintings by Hugh Syme, the guy who did all of the covers for Rush albums. And because these did so well, and because the publisher, the Canadian publisher, knew that Resurrection Inc., my first novel, was also inspired by our Rush album, they offered to reprint it. And not only did they offer to reprint it, they promised me that they were getting me a brand new cover, <laughs> a cover that's a slightly better than the other one. But the cover that's painted by Hugh Syme, the guy who painted the cover for the album Grace Under Pressure, that inspired it in the first place. And it looks really cool. So there's the new cover. And that's my popcorn theory of success. And that's my time. And we have popcorn in the back. Eat your popcorn. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>